everyone, this is Ping. Welcome back to another episode. Today,、um, today's guest is Charles, and he shared about his experience in the high school in California. And as we might know, it's very competitive in the US to. Uh, to apply for colleges, so whatever he did was pretty intentional,、um, I will say, and it was just quite fascinating for me to see、um, how a high schooler、um, came out from that environment and also prepare himself to to go into a prestigious、um, college in the U.S. So yeah.、Um, I just want to thank you that I've seen new ratings and stars on Apple Podcasts. So if you haven't already, please do leave a message to me or、um, just give me five stars, and that'll help other people to see more of what I cover in the podcast. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Chai with Ping. This is Ping Robert. In this podcast, I cover underrepresented and personal stories. Join me with a cup of chai and take a listen. Just nervous, but I guess maybe、uh, it'll just get better as we go along. Yeah.、Uh, you ready? Okay. 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 Welcome back to Chai with Ping. Thank you for listening. And my name is Ping Robert.、Um, I cover a lot of immigrant stories, international students' experience, and also minoritized issues. So if you like my show,、um, please do follow me on Facebook and Instagram by Chai with Ping. And you can also find my show on different platforms for podcasts as well as on YouTube if you prefer. A you know you don't have to download anything.、Um, today. Today I invited a special guest to talk about some experience back in Southern California, which I find is super uber interesting. And so he is from a Taiwanese family. He's he, both his parents are Taiwanese immigrants, and then they have been based in California for some time. And then he was born and grew,、uh, he grew up in SoCal. SoCal that's a word I also learned from him. And he studied、uh, mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley. So fancy. And the rest. I will let him to introduce himself. Let's welcome Charles Jiasheng Li. Woo! Yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for that intro, Ping. Yeah. yeah so、uh, as as you covered, right?、Uh, I come、uh, from a Taiwanese family. My parents are both immigrants, and I was born in San Diego, and moved up to Irvine when I was six. So Irvine is largely where I consider my hometown and where I grew up, where I went through elementary, middle, and high school.、Uh, and so after after high school, I went to UC Berkeley for college. And just going through the college admissions process and going through the academic process to get there was something that was pretty challenging, and definitely very formative、uh, in many different ways. As I as I went throughout college and graduated from there, but、mm. so I graduated、uh, UC Berkeley as、mm-hmm. Ping mentioned, mechanical engineering class of 2019. I moved over here where I'm now based in Colorado, and it's been almost two years. So I know, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to come to the show. I mean, it's just so interesting because I when I as a Taiwanese think about UC Berkeley or UC system universities, it's just like whoa, so high and fancy over there, right? <laughs> But something you you mentioned that really piqued my interest because you, it, it's just like I don't know how you guys get through. You know, it's from middle school, high school, into college to to go into that realm. Like, how do you be academically successful? That's something we always assume that you know, someone someone just、uh, so they're smart or they study a lot, that kind of thing. But whatever you share with me was like pretty unique. So that's why I want to pick your brain today. <laughs> sure, of <laughs> course. <laughs> yeah, and so you already shared a little background and your identities with us. Is there anything else you want the listeners to know before we start the topic? Uh, no. I think I think you described me. You introduced me very well. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Cool. 
today we're going to talk about educational system that you went through and then based on your personal story, because uh, as the listeners around the world might not know, it, there's not centralized uh, system in the U.S. A lot of states will have their own system, um, but still, like you guys, after grad, uh, high school, you need to take SAT. I think that's a standard thing because like then you can apply for colleges. But right. then um, in Taiwan, it is so common because everything is centralized, mm -hmm. right? Like I will be studying something the same as another city uh, or another school. Um, but in Taiwan, there is a common culture for uh, education is that students will go to Buxi Ban. Um, I find it very hard to explain it to other people because Buxi Ban is actually something very cultural. Some people say it's a cram school, cram school. So that's the word that I actually learned in our English class in middle school. Mm -hmm. um, but like cream school, like a lot of people don't understand what it is. So basically after the standardized schooling, um, so we get out from school, like what, 5 p.m. And a lot of students will go to another private owned company. It's almost like a tutoring one, but a lot of them are in a group setting. And so the teacher will either reteach or they kind of teach ahead of the curriculum from the um public or like the regular school track. And then there are things like that in California. Could you talk about that? Yeah, of course. So when I think back to the very earliest form of it that I attended, at least to the extent where there was any sort of tutoring or remedial education, or uh, we would go and do extra classes and do packets, so to speak. I don't know if you have the same back in Taiwan. That started from elementary school or when I was very young. It was really interesting because I have uh, some family friends that own a small business called Irvine Art and Music Center. And that kind of tied in a little bit. Uh, as a side note, I started learning to play piano when I was very young. So I would go there very often for piano classes. And I would also, it turned out that they also had a daycare kind of program uh, just to, yeah, just to take care of young students and to give them a place to be. And so I went through that uh, starting in elementary school. That was the very earliest form of it. And there was basic uh, math tutoring programs in the summer, um, as well as, uh, programs like chess uh, and just having the opportunity, you know, to go out to the park and just hang out. Um, so that was all more in a, in a fun manner, I suppose. I, uh, more of when the tutoring started. And so this is why I think it's really interesting how in Southern California, there can be m more of a Bushibun-esque uh, or similar culture because for me, the tutoring for classes that that, that began uh, around middle school for me, uh, I think seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade was when I really started going. Um, so I think this serves a couple of purposes. Um, number one is that it does prepare the student um, by giving them more practice uh, and stuff like that with academic concepts. Um, but I think the second and more subtle, uh, more easily overlooked aspect is that my parents uh, are both working parents. So there's no stay at home mom or stay at home dad to necessarily take care of me after school. And I'm sure, uh, so I'm, a, I'm an only child. So that was something that wasn't uh, mentioned. But if I went uh, back home after school, it would only just be me. And looking back on it, I don't think my parents would really be comfortable with that fact of just me being alone for long periods of time at, at home. Yeah, so because my dad was a, he worked a regular nine to five job and my mom worked as a nurse. So she would often only get off around 7.30 p.m. Anyway, uh, I digress. But it was starting in seventh and eighth grade that I started taking classes for math, classes for English, classes for writing. 
And they all coincide in the sense that they're related to school, but they would also begin to branch into actual SAT slash ACT test prep. And this, I think, started for me around eighth grade. And so I actually kept going. I, I went to that same uh, Bushipan. Uh, it's called uh, Harvard Square. I know there's some many others around that area where I grew up um, that I, kn- I knew other <laughs> students went to. Harvard but, Square. <laughs> yes, yes. They really have a specific goal. They're sending think, students to Harvard. I think the idea is that the founder graduated from Harvard and that they were there in the next near the Harvard campus. There's an actual Harvard Square. And it's supposed to be like a funny name and everything or like a play on <laughs> words type of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess you can kind of see that in the in the environment. Just mm. in Irvine, it's a very it, it's a more affluent crowd for sure. And there's a lot of competitive high schools in the area, uh, many very renowned, um, and which regularly send at least a few students every year to Ivy's and other similarly competitive schools. Um, yeah. So back to the Bushi Bunch so at Harvard Square, I went there until I graduated because my mom actually put me through the college preparation program, uh, which lasted four years. And so what that included was it included the typical throughout the school year, the school, the fall and spring semester, the Bushi Bun uh, kind of environment, as well as in the summertime, there would be further there would be further test prep or just opportunities to just be there at the, at the, uh, not the facility. That sounds so impersonal. It's kind of a facility or at a center. At, yeah. The center. It's an yeah. educational center. Center yeah. sounds better. Yeah. Facility yeah. sounds not so great. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few questions just to follow up. So, because I, I know that there are at least one fourth of the population in California are, Chinese or like you know East Asians. Um, yes. so who are those people who went to Hover Square with you? So the people are they who all Asians? To, mostly, yeah. The <laughs> okay. majority of them were um as I remember it, the yeah, just an- anecdotally, the majority of the people who went were ABCs like me or like Asian. Uh, uh, American-born Chinese, right? American-born Asians, just Asian Americans in general. Um, it was at the time that I went, and I graduated yeah. high school in 2015. Okay. It was a little rare to see somebody who is not uh, Asian, like yeah, Asian or East mm-hmm. Asian. I think okay. more specifically. Got it. And what about the curriculum? Do they teach you, just like what I mentioned in Taiwan, do they teach you ahead of the regular curriculum? Or it's just kind of a supplementary thing? They teach at the same time and then kind of help you guys to practice the same curriculum? It could be both. Ooh. So when you go throughout the school year, mm-hmm. uh, there would be tutors that you could go to and talk to. It was, It's really interesting. So they actually had they had a schedule of sorts that you could attend. So teachers would actually, similar to how in college where you can kind of lay out your day or your schedule of classes, they would schedule tutors to teach on certain topics on certain days at certain times. So maybe there would be a teacher that would go over writing from Tuesdays and Thursdays um, more in the evening time. Um, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, somebody would go over English or math. Um, it, it all very depends. And then as you needed, you could either drop in to one of those classes. Um, but other times, depending on, <laughs> I think, depending on how your parents kept you accountable, let's put it that way, maybe <laughs> they would want you to attend a specific class if it, yeah is beyond your grade level but wanted to uh 
to push you in that kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and people, uh, students would stay pretty late at times uh, because I mentioned earlier about mm-hmm. my parents' work situation. I was actually one of the kids who stayed uh, the latest at times. And so they actually had quite a few kids that would stay until or past dinner time. So they even had a food ordering service where if you wanted to get a lunch or if you wanted to get in on the dinner menu, you got to register. You just had to bring some money for that day and pay them. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And they'd go out and they'd pick up uh, from yeah. the from neighboring restaurants or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. And <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. They really serve you pretty well. Do they yeah, charge as, extra or they just charge you the food money? I think it's just the food. I'm not super sure. I mean, got it. Yeah. I, I wasn't, I'm not too sure of how they partnered or did yeah. that kind of food stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah. I would say roughly $10 a meal. And- got it. Hmm, let's put it this way in Taiwan, a lot of students take English math yeah. chemistry physics that kind of thing so which is tougher so not many people will learn like china it will take classes for chinese history or geography because all those like it's more about memories and yeah. also kind of the quota of a so-called sat in taiwan is not as high as as english and math so what are the common subjects that you guys will be taking to get supported you're saying like school subjects not Mm-hmm. standardized testing subjects uh in huh what what are the difference well because in standardized testing so uh for the sat or the act specifically yeah those classes are based around the sections of the test uh-huh so there are specifically there's specifically right like math mm-hmm. uh section there's an essay writing section so there would be oh. times where we'd just have to practice writing essays in 30 minutes yeah. uh, because we we were practicing for the test. Um, yeah, and there's English comprehension. So they'd have all these English questions and write uh, a lot of a lot and a lot of practice tests. So okay. there would be spe- it would be specifically geared for that. OK. And and for the regular classes, it was mm-hmm. more of. Right. Do you want to go into do you, do you want to take a math class to catch up on on some math or do some practice right packets or yeah. other workbooks on those? Got it. OK. Yeah. But the That's- one the common ones that I mean, students all go to is I would say math. Is a pretty common one. Yeah. Um, English and writing. Uh, if the students needed it and it's not necessary. So. It's different because class, like school subjects of English, it's not about taking those kinds of standardized tests. So it'd be about reading and essay writing. So a lot of what they would do, uh, the tutors would help out with reading essays and proofreading and giving feedback on students' homework. So that was another aspect of, that's another aspect that differentiates between whether tutoring is geared for class or yeah. it's, it's, tutor, it's geared for uh Test prep. Standardized testing. Yeah. Test Got prep. it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I mean, there are different tracks for that, but like f- until you really need to prep for SAT, then you'll be taking like regular subjects, right? <laughs> or not. <laughs> or basically yeah. you just you just yeah. already started test prepping yeah. when you were in middle high. I mean, depending on you know how yeah, your parents wanted to prepare you or anything. Uh-huh. It was not uncommon for people to for students to go to test prep multiple summers in a row. Oh, I wow. was I was one of them. <laughs> wait, wait, but like I thought American kids would go to camps and you, you know different camping trips, that kind of thing. But for you, did you just spend all these summers well, in a so it center? Wasn't, it wasn't quite like that. Uh huh. So I guess. This moves into the other aspect of high school where I began to do a lot more extracurriculars. Um, 
at least in the summertime. Well, this was only three days though. I did marching band in high school. So yeah. I, I performed uh, in the color guard. Mm-hmm. So I did color guard all four years yeah. of high school mm. uh, and then marched as a marching drum major for the band. Yeah. Uh, which is like a, like a, I was essentially a co-captain of the band, I guess you could say. That's, yeah. that's what the drum major position is like. But I did that in my senior fall semester. Wow. Um, yeah. But just to share just one of the extracurriculars. So I did, so I would do that during the summers Mm -hmm. and to start exploring more about engineering and about my field, um, my college admissions counselor or college guidance counselor. And this is something that was included in that uh, package of being, uh, of going to that Bushibun is that they also had their own college guidance counselors that they could assign you under to help kind of guide you in crafting your high school resume and high school persona for the college admissions process. And this is separate to, I know normally it may be a bit under, uh, it may be under resourced, but in public schools, students often have um, a a college admissions counselor as well, or, or Mm. just a guidance counselor in general. Got it. So I think you started a great point that leads to our next question is like, what are the important components as a high school student to be competitive? Recently, I've been watching Glee. So it's basically a high school musical series. And if if listeners like to, to listen to songs and dance around, that that is the whole background is about a high school. So right. and then they talk about, you know, they, they need to have like clubs experience or the captain of a cheerleading team. Um, So what are the important points for you? Right. So that answers one of the things behind how I began to spend my summers. So I started talking a little bit about marching band, but there were two summers where I did internships, so to speak, unpaid. Um, The first one was I had the opportunity to assist um, a graduate student um, at Caltech under under uh, an aerospace professor. So wh- how that happened was Caltech had a bunch of public lectures that were available. And I was, back then I was a very impressionable young kid and I was <laughs> obsessed with the idea of becoming an aerospace engineer and making grand contributions to to the whole the, world yeah to the whole world the field yeah. of aerospace and i want to be yeah. like this hot shot guy and <laughs> yeah. but okay. anyway yeah. so so i attended this lecture um and afterwards i approached the professor to talk about the lecture even though i <laughs> the technical part i understood let's just say that technical language at that level to a ninth grader is a little bit like listening to a foreign language (laughs) too hard (laughs) yes yeah but Ah. uh, I was interested and she was she was very nice Uh, shout out to professor Beverly McKeon by the way yeah she's really awesome and and so I had the chance to just visit her uh, for a day in her lab and afterwards, she said, oh, well, I have a spot if you want to help out one of my grad students with uh, if you if you want to help out one of my labs. So I did that for a summer. So that was like 40 ish hours a week. Yeah. Another question. So high school internships, are they paid or unpaid? That's the thing. For most people, it's unpaid. Just to get experience. Yeah, just to get experience. Uh And I mean, there are opportunities where you can get paid. I found that those were very difficult to get. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think because at the field that I wanted to go into, engineering, 
there's not well it, it depends but i think there it's really a company is just eager and interested in taking on students and mentoring as opposed to actually providing a lot of value i say but there might be some people who disagree with me though but maybe that's also because now i'm comparing it with nearly two years of professional experience so. oh yeah definitely and, but and like, i was thinking how much you... could i really have contributed <laughs> in high school um, well we're just little gears of a whole machine right in a society yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly exactly yeah ah. so so that was one of the things that i did in the summer and then the other one mm -hmm. another summer i found uh a, an opportunity to just be in to just help out wherever I could, or just to experience what it's like being in a small engineering firm. So, so your question was about what could, what are the things that could help make a student competitive? That's right. In, uh, for, in college applications. Yeah. My personal take on this mm -hmm. is that the tests and the GPA they're really just a baseline to see whether you're qualified and it's really about the extracurriculars you do it's about the personal statement slash the college essays that you apply with that really make the difference mm -hmm. so when i applied the biggest I think it's still used by many students today, but there's something called the Common App. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, but what basically, is that? Basically, a lot of schools have agreed to put their college admissions. Ba basically, a lot of universities have agreed to centralize their college admissions process and put them on a like a portal of sorts called the common app. I don't know if that's changed since then. But I remember you'd have to post your transcript, you'd have to post your uh, test scores. You'd have to post uh, your extracurriculars. Um, and that was where you would input and submit your essays, your college essays. Yeah. And so yeah, question. I have another question. So you talk about extracurricular activity. So you join a band. So that's like right. a club so, experience. Right. Is volunteering experience also very important? I would say volunteering experience is pretty important, but it, it also depends. So I actually didn't really do any volunteering experience back in high school. So I guess you could say my extracurricular experience was focused more around achievement um yeah slash achievement slash internships so what i mean by that is so i did marching band for four years um, and i think being involved for all four years it does show a certain amount of commitment rather than just like jumping back and forth between groups so it shows consistency i think that's a that's a helpful thing um but i did start helping out in my section and eventually the the marching band as a whole um in section leadership since my sophomore year so so i had uh, a few years i had the majority of years of experience on that um, because I was kind of interested in just like learning about inventions and stuff like that. I started a club called uh, the Invent Team that was <laughs> like That Invent is team, so cool. Is it like an invention club? Yeah, yeah. Except it was more of just like something that I was excited about, but I didn't actually understand what the process of inventing or invention looked like. <laughs> but, um, and it, this was modeled after 
the MIT Lemelson Invent Team program, but we never we didn't actually um, submit anything. But it was fun. We would gather every week or every other week and just talk about inventions and just interesting technologies and stuff like that. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. And then in mm-hmm. senior, so I so I founded that club in sophomore year. Mm-hmm. Um, and in senior year, I had the opportunity to turn that club into more of a general engineering club mm-hmm. um, because we had an engineering club on campus and the seniors were, it, it was a small club at the time and the seniors all graduated. And so I talked to the teacher who was my, who, or who was the advisor for their club and who happened to be my math teacher for three years in a row. So I, he's, he's my, uh, he's one of my favorite teachers. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Charles Balin. Yeah. Another Charles. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. He's yeah. only off by my name for by three letters that add a B E I in front of my Lynn. And it's just Charles Balin. That is so, wow. That is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Then so you talked about your experiences and but like something is interesting is about the essay you submit. The essay I heard, you know, on in the movies or whatever, they say that you know essays just have to make yourself so special. And then yeah. it's like you need to persuade the the uh, admission com- committee in a college to see how different you are. Is that true? Yeah, that that is very true. And I and that's definitely something. I think naturally everybody, whether you're successful in the college admissions program or not, uh, whether you're su- whether you get into whatever you want to or not, I think it's challenging for everybody because there's this pressure to to pour out all of your entire being and justify yourself into how I'm such a unique and diverse and capable individual with a compelling story all on one page, you know, and that's not, it's just, the it, that's kind of the reality of it is what it is because, you know, the college admissions officers don't have the time to get time. to know every secret. Yeah. Every single applicant and it's, yeah. and it's challenging and it's hard. Um, I think what I, I can only uh, conjecture, I suppose, at mm-hmm. what helped make me stand up. Yeah. But I think it was really interesting because, um, yeah, on paper in a high school setting, I was very qualified. I did a lot of extracurriculars. I had leadership uh, experience and potential. And I was geared towards a STEM path, an engineering, mm-hmm. engineering path. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wrote about my experience in Color Guard because that was what was the most formative for me throughout my high school years. Yeah, and it's it's a very interesting environment because um, just not many guys in general go yeah. into Color Guard in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember in our high school guard of nearly 20 students, there might be three guys maximum. Um, yeah, <laughs> you're giving me nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. And then to add on top of that, I don't, I don't know how many people in STEM do color guard, but well, Actually, my my one of my former captains, uh, she did computer science, so that's interesting too. Yeah. Also went to Berkeley. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and I I I had a comp- I had a really interesting story that I yeah. wrote about. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just, and to be fair, uh, or not to be fair, but I I did have essay help. That was mm. also provided by, um, by the Bushi Bun, by the college yeah. guidance counselor. Yeah. Um, and I think I roughly, I loosely wrote about being introduced to Color Guard, 
um, in a narrative way, of course. And then just talking about, I think, relating my growth in Color Guard as a regular member to a leader and contributor in the group. Because more personally speaking, I think growing up, I've always been a real jokester kind of guy. I've been a, I've, um, I have kind of a tiaopi yeah, the personality. <laughs> <laughs> a little naughty, naughty. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm not, yeah, I'm not the greatest rule follower. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember I was, I was pretty happy in middle school. I was like, wow, I'm starting to become more mature because I stopped going to the principal office at least once every year. <laughs> wow. Okay. I was, yeah, I was a weird kid. Um. <laughs> you were just so smart. So everything is just kind of easy. So then you start making things harder or like um, making something, making something up for the interesting side. Maybe, or maybe, yeah. I mean, I also don't want to be like tooting my own horn or anything, mm. you know, but I just, don't think I mesh very well in a very formal, just like schooling structure. Yeah. But it is what it is. Um, yeah. And my person, yeah. So going back to it, to my essay, mm. I, I talked about how that was kind of how I approached everything. It was so easy for me to just try to want to have fun and have a good time. And if there's, and, and and in one in some ways that's a real blessing because you know if you're just stuck in the grind of the day to day and nothing's joyful then gosh that sounds like a sorry existence but um <laughs> but on the other hand mm. um i would try if there's something serious i wouldn't really apply myself or i would uh I would I wouldn't really apply myself because I would take everything like a joke. I would treat everything like a joke. And this really started to bother me in high school because I don't know how my other peers saw me, but maybe because I always behaved like a class clown. I thought sometimes it was difficult for people to take me seriously when I wanted to be heard seriously. Mm. So I so color guard was a big contributor to that, but it began to be one of the uh, a proving ground for myself mm -hmm. as I tried mm -hmm. to establish myself and try to shed that old persona of just being class clown, jokester kind of guy, but yeah. somebody who's also capable of applying himself and, yeah. you know, turning up the heat when it's necessary. Um, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, um, what was the biggest lesson that you learned throughout your high school years? Ooh, biggest lesson. <laughs> um, I would say there are many lessons. I think the most important lessons are the ones that I've gained after the fact, many, many years after the fact. What I mean to say by that is in high school, um, the lesson was, well, I was kind of a prideful person back then. Um, I think me and a few of my friends kind of understood that depending on the class, you know, we could skate by in a sense, not because it's not because it's like that easy or anything like that, but it's just because, you know, oh, we can just do what we want by getting the bare minimum, you know, and that, that, that should be good enough. Or alternatively, I'd have those friends where, <laughs> where I don't know if you've come across similar friends, but when they take tests, they'll be, oh, I failed. And then you're like, 
<laughs> no way, dude. You didn't actually fail, right? You're like, yeah, I only got 94. And you're like, oh my God, I want to freaking like lay the beat down on you, you know? Yeah. You see me? Yeah. I'm struggling, blood, sweat, and tears over there. Yeah. But I think there, there's a bit of this pressure to, to look like you're successful, mm. but you don't want to let others see how hard you're actually working. Yeah. Um, and so I think. I felt like I had been able to maintain that facade mm. semi decently well enough through high school. Yeah. Um, but it was only after um, I be- uh, I came to college and I began reflecting on it. And also, uh, faith uh, was an, a very important part. Uh, it was a very important lens through which I could reflect upon my high school experience. Mm-hmm. But my greatest lesson that I learned was truly, truly not to measure myself by my accomplishments and not mm. to find my worth and my identity um, in that. Because like I mentioned before, I was very impressionable and I was mm. a very dream big kind of person. But when yeah. it came down to the details and what you have to do step by step, it was very easy for me to overanalyze, overthink and get into some kind of analysis paralysis type of thinking. So, Got it. yeah. So mm-hmm. biggest lesson is that it's really, it's, it's good and it's important to apply yourself. But frankly speaking, those things are not where you should be putting your worth and your identity in because those are very heavy burdens for anyone to bear. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah. I yeah, that that was a great learning. And because of time, we couldn't cover your college life, but I'm really hoping that you'll come back and then we can record another episode for your college life. Cause from what I understood from your stories, is like the life in UC Berkeley really changed your perception about a lot of things. Um right, so yeah. we can probably look forward to the next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Before we end, is there anything you want to add? Um, anything I want to add. So this is kind of interesting of a topic. Mm-hmm. I think that you that you've that we've been discussing today. And it's very interesting because I've been helping out at my church with youth ministry. Uh, serving in youth for uh, a little over a year now at this point. And as I'm serving and as I reflect upon my previous uh, experience in in high school and middle school and what, what that, what that's like, I guess in a way I'm trying to live out the lesson that I mentioned just now that um that frankly it it putting your stock in worldly things and i mean this is the, i know it sounds ideal but just bear with me uh <laughs> that that putting your stock in in worldly achievements and pursuits and defining your worth and identity in them that it's not going to be uh sustainable and I just, yeah, I just desire all the best for my students that I'm watching over currently. And, and I, I do this because I felt like, like, uh, it can be really, it, it can be really competitive in that type of, uh, like school competitive environment for college. It can be a real pressure cooker. Uh, if you allow yourself just to get caught up in the in the grades and the testing and right in order to seem competitive oh i have to do honors this i have to do ap this i have to reach a certain threshold on my tests you know i have to get five on ap um it, it yeah so but overall i think mm. it's just a good experience and it's it's important to um <laughs> Am I allowed to share about my faith on? <laughs> oh, sure, go ahead. I mean, yeah. if there's anything, yeah, I think I, I, I think that's the yeah. for personally for me that's the big elephant in the room. I can't really skirt around 
Oh, you um, you could totally say it. Yeah, it's yeah. it's being able to have security and confidence in something that's greater one that's greater than myself and two that's eternal and unchanging and that's my faith in uh Jesus Christ because mm -hmm. he's the because he's unchanging. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, but overall my message would be high school is still a very fun time. There yeah. can be a lot of ups and downs um, for students who are trying to establish themselves and beginning to explore their new identities and differentiating themselves from their peers mm -hmm. uh, and beginning to take on uh, larger and larger responsibilities, uh, whether it's in the form of volunteering or clubs or leadership. Um, but it, it is a very exciting time. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for inviting me to speak about this today. Thank you or so much for sharing your experience. Experience. Yeah, this is wonderful. And I think after listening to your stories more and I almost thought, so my conclusion and my takeaway is, it sounds like there is a lot of price tag on the students in high school and as students are chasing after a lot of other things. But I just want to put it out there for if you're um, a high school student or even like, like a student or person listening to this episode, I really want you to take a think, take a thought for th uh, to think about, you know, if what we do defined us. Um, mm. I, I, I feel we're more than that. It's not because I, I have a high GPA and then I am just, uh, you know, that that's just my value because things kind of change and, you know, price tag change, market change, and then inflation change things. So what is really stable and the core value in us is, is something that we should grab and reflect on. Yeah. So something about my college or something about my high school career and which is why I spoke so much about my faith is because I felt that I defined myself I, or I found my worth in my achievements and in my, in my accomplishments so much, but it came at a large personal cost. It came at a very big mental health cost. And what I didn't share is that I struggled to sleep properly throughout high school. Um, there were times that I would go to bed at midnight or 1 a.m. But in order to right, be more competitive and in order to add another class to my schedule, uh, I added what's called a zero period because in the U.S., uh, in the States, classes go from first period to know, maybe your sixth period or seventh period. Uh, maybe every school is different. But I had a zero period. So in the sense I had a pre-class before actual class, which was so that meant I started class at 630 or 645, uh, 645, I think, um, every day. Yeah. And there were times that. And, 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 it, and it, I hate to say this, but yeah, there were classes where it felt easy to skate by and I would straight up nap in the middle of class. I would just you know, arm on desk, head on arm. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a Taiwanese kid. <laughs> yeah, throughout throughout class. You yeah. Know? And there are times in lunch, I would just go to the library, pull my hoodie over my head and just like nap because mm, you're I just need tired. a lot of sleep. I need yeah. a lot of sleep. Even now I feel, I feel optimal with eight slash eight and a half hours of sleep. Yeah, yeah. And I heard that you need less the older you get, but. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um. Yeah. And so because it was such a pressure cooker environment, maybe mm. not because not necessarily of what anyone else did, but perhaps purely because of the pressure I put on myself uh, was one, because I felt in order to be really successful or to chase after uh, my ambition, I thought it was I thought I had to be ruthless to myself. And so I would be very, very harsh on myself and very demanding of myself. Um, and two, just the fact of trying to just keep up with a packed schedule of classes and extracurriculars. So for a few years afterwards, when I would go back to high school to visit old uh, teachers or anything like that, uh, I would get a little bit of anxiety slash maybe I wouldn't go as far fetched as to say, or not far, far fetched. I wouldn't go as far as to say PTSD, but I would start like, 
like just getting really anxious about just being on campus um, again. And I never, I think I tended to look at high school in a poor light uh, because of it. And it wasn't un really until um, I became Christian in college that I was able to appreciate my high school experience for what it was rather than painting it in an all negative light about, oh, it was so hard, so educationally uh, competitive, um, so much drama, yada, 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 just growing up at that, you know, in that, and not just as a school, but also other personal stuff. I was able to appreciate it for what it's what, for what it was, that those yeah. are the hardships that, mm -hmm. that people begin to face. Um, but it, there's also those irreplaceable high school memories that you make with friends and, you know, whether you're studying together or whether you're doing extracurriculars and at, for Color Guard, it was staying, practicing on Saturday mornings with them and having, mm. uh, going to, uh, going to the pool, just hanging out with them and just a lot of like, time for friendship and just after, after school, even after our six period band slash color guard class ended, many of us would stay after just to chat and hang out. Mm. Yeah, so. Oh. Thanks for listening to Try With Ping. If you think someone will benefit from this episode, don't forget to share with them. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. If you like my show, you can buy me a chai with small gifts. Details are in the episode notes. Till next time! Thank you.